you just are not thinking big enough. If you're not being criticized by experts, if they're not saying you're out of your mind, if they're not saying you're irresponsible with your big thinking, you're unethical with your big thinking, you're raising people's hopes unnecessarily. If people aren't saying that to you, you're just part of the system, man. You're not, you're not thinking big enough. Welcome back. I'm T.D. Smyers, and this is No Clichés. Hello and welcome to No Clichés, a companion podcast to my coaching, consulting, and leadership writing at A Bold Leader. I'm T.D. Smyers, and I've been in leadership my whole life, from taking point in small teams, to command of military troops, to multiple roles as a CEO. And if this life in leadership has taught me anything, it's that leading is more art than science. I call this No Clichés because we'll go well beyond the basics here leaving behind the LinkedIn infographics to dive headfirst into some of the toughest situations a leader can face. Through stories and interviews, you'll get a behind-the-scenes look at leadership truths that always apply, no matter what industry or sector you're in. This is a no-holds-barred leadership conversation, so strap in. I first met Dan Pilate in a tweet. I was a regional CEO for the American Red Cross in Dallas, and one morning I was online reviewing the latest round of the recurring pounding my organization took on social media. This time, like many other times, it was the media organization ProPublica on NPR blasting our international arm for their Haitian relief efforts. So as I surveyed the carnage, one response to a particularly unfair post caught my eye. It was from a source identified as Charity Defense Council, and it proceeded to take ProPublica to task chiding them for spreading misinformation while laying out the impressive Red Cross record in no uncertain terms. $500 million raised for the effort, emergency shelter for 860,000 people, renovated, rebuilt, or rented homes for 54,000, new infrastructure, bridges, roads, sanitation. He went on and on, discrediting the report and revealing the media malpractice responsible for it. Wow. Nobody not wearing a Red Cross logo ever defended our work like this. Who was this masked man? So I pulled up Charity Defense Council's profile and saw that they were pretty new on the scene. Dan undoubtedly won't remember this, but I clicked the little envelope and sent the council a direct message. A simple note. Thanks for having our backs. It's appreciated. A little more research into the council revealed their founder, Dan Pilato. Now, if you Google Dan, he comes up identified as an American entrepreneur, and that's true enough, he is, but this description is really only part of the story. Dan's a visionary, a developmental economics guru with a Harvard sheepskin, a social sector champion, and a bold leader. You may have already heard of him or read him since he's been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Forbes Magazine, and a host of others. Or you may even have seen him since he's appeared on the Today Show, CNN, CNBC, American Public Media's Marketplace, the TED Radio Hour, BBC's Business Matters, and on and on. In fact, if you haven't seen his viral TED Talk, The Way We Think About Charity is Dead Wrong on YouTube, go there as soon as you finish this podcast episode. It'll change your whole worldview. And there's a link at aboldleader.com to help you get there. Dan challenges the whole book of rules. You know, the one that says that nonprofits have to operate on a separate set of rules from the rest of the economic world, that they have to solve the toughest challenges that face humanity and do it on a shoestring budget while taking a personal vow of poverty. So if you think the primary fiscal responsibility of a nonprofit is to keep overhead low, stand by to have your charity worldview rocked. Dan Pilata, a bold leader. So welcome to No Clichés, Dan Pilata, a bold leader. How you doing, Dan? I'm good, TD. How are you doing? I'm good, man. It's been quite a few years since we last worked together when you came to North Texas to train a bunch of our nonprofit board members and staff here. You remember that trip? I sure do. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, we enjoyed having you and touched a lot of organizations and then uh, had the opportunity to bring you back and then uh, address just my folks at uh, United Way of Tarrant County, and it changed the organization. How are the triplets? Oh, they're great. They're 14 years old now. Yeah, Unbelievable. They're, they're, they're a year and a half away from uh, from driving. So uh, uh, I, I, I got a year and a half of sanity left. <laughs> yeah, and, and three at the same time. That's three, perfect. Yeah, three cars, three insurance bills. 
Big things Man. to worry about. As a father of kids myself, I just can't even imagine the, the, the load of triplets, especially in their teens. So, you know, God bless you, man. <laughs> Thanks. So for people that are unfamiliar with your work, uh, you've, you've done some, you've identified some disparities in the way that we handle nonprofits and in, in the rules that nonprofits have to abide by that don't apply to the rest of the, the economic world. This podcast is on leadership. So from a leadership perspective, leading through situations, you know, where the rules in place, they're no longer apply, they're anachronistic, or they don't get the job done. Maybe the rules haven't been written yet, but, um, or maybe just the rules are wrong, right? And so in your work, you shed light on five ways that our current financial rules discriminate against the sector. So uh, how are compensation, ads, and marketing, risk, time, and, and profit to attract risk capital? How are they looked at differently between the, the, the economic sectors? Well, if you look at the, our attitudes about compensation in the for-profit sector are, you know, based on the value people produce. You know, the more value someone produces, the more money they ought to be able to make without limit. I mean, you, you look at the e- Elon Musk is the wealthiest uh, person in the world right now. Well, it changes every few weeks, but I, I think <laughs> I think he's close to on top. He's hanging in there. And, um, you know, okay, the guy has produced enormous, enormous um, value to humanity um, with with Tesla and SpaceX and the other things that he's doing, and um, in the nonprofit sector, there's a there's a strict cap on compensation, no matter, and and it's it ain't nowhere near uh, yeah. Elon Musk's, you know, it's it's <laughs> uh, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and and you know what that means is uh, that people who have economic aspirations for their life, um, as well as aspirations of making a difference, are simply not going to go into the nonprofit sector. You know, they're just not going to accept that level of economic sacrifice in return for making a difference. And they say, well, I'll make a difference in, in another way. And you certainly can't say that Elon Musk is not making a difference in the world. So that's the first area. The second is, as you said, advertising and marketing, where, you know, we let Coca-Cola and BMW and McDonald's spend on advertising to their heart's delight, you know, spend, 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 spend and uh, try and bring in new customers. But we don't like our charities to spend our donated dollars on advertising. Well, it seems to make sense if you don't really look at it, right? Yeah, I want all that money to go to the cause. But what does that mean? It means the charity can't tell anybody what they're actually doing. Um, you know, McDonald's comes out with the, you know, St. Patrick's Day shake and the whole world knows about it, right? But I can't <laughs> tell you that my program is actually helping to alleviate uh, hunger in, in Boston. Well, if I can't tell you that my program works, how on earth am I going to get you to donate to me? Uh, how on earth am I going to grow? You know, I'm going to remain the, the, the best kept secret in the world for eliminating child hunger. Uh, the third area is um, is risk taking. You know, um, I, I can't lose any money on a fundraising event, any fundraising event that I do or any fundraising campaign that I do. It's got to return, you know, 90 cents on the dollar. or I'm going to get crucified in the media. So I can't try anything new because I don't know if that new thing is going to return 90 cents on the dollar. Well, you know, Disney doesn't have that restriction. They can make a new movie not knowing whether it's going to make money or not. And, and they, you know, build uh, an empire, a very profitable empire with what, what is called a non-linear business model. Non-linear meaning, you know, I'm going to make a lot of movies. Some of them are going to succeed. Some of them are going to fail dismally. But more are going to succeed than fail. And on that basis, I can build something very big. But if we tell nonprofits, you can never fail at fundraising, then they're never going to try anything new and they're going to once again remain tiny. And then time, you know, we let we let Elon Musk just today unveil the Giga Berlin factory that's going to produce half a million cars a year. Well, he's going to amortize the cost of that factory over decades. Well, but the nonprofit sector has to report every expense every 12 months, um, which means you don't have any time to actually uh, allow the things that you're doing to prove themselves. And then the, and then the last thing is uh, capital and profit itself. 
Um, it's called the non-profit sector, which means you can't <laughs> return any profit to investors, which means that Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, Tim Cook, you know, they can raise all kinds of capital on the capital markets to try out all their new ideas. And the nonprofit sector is starved for any kind of growth capital or risk capital. Well, you put those five things together and you've just uh, annihilated the nonprofit sector's ability to grow and actually scale to the size of these massive human problems uh, and the massive human suffering in the world that the nonprofit sector could, if you unchained it, actually address. Yeah, I've lived a lot of that. You know, as an, I was a nonprofit exec uh, for eight years after I left the Navy, first with American Red Cross and then with United Way. And a lot, you know, a lot of us that left the Navy went into uh, the, the private sector and commercial endeavors. And I had a friend that was talking to me about it and he had dipped his toe into the nonprofit world by sitting on a board. And, and he, he was telling me, man, I don't know how you do it. I mean, you've got to recapitalize your whole business every year. You know, annually, you've got right. to raise. Well, the notion of capital is, is um, lost on the nonprofit sector. The notion itself of capital doesn't really exist. So the way nonprofits think about capital, because the way they've been trained, is petty cash. What, whatever petty cash I have, whatever money I have left over in the bank, that's my capital for trying something new. And it doesn't dawn on the sector, no, no, I could go out into the capital markets and raise hundreds of millions of dollars in capital to launch that new thing that I want to do. Well, if the, if the sector is blind to the notion of capital, then you can hardly blame capitalism for the problems in the, in the world. <laughs> it's just that the nonprofit sector ignores its tools or has been prevented from using its tools. Now, you, you tell an amazingly impressive kind of antithesis of this in what you did uh, with the AIDS rides and the three-day walks for breast cancer. And you talk about the scale you were able to achieve with those. You want to cover that story real quick? Yeah, well, you know, I created the AIDS rides. I created the breast cancer three days. We raised uh, almost six hundred million dollars in in nine years, um, and our events were very, very big. You know, uh, well, you know, the Chicago Breast Cancer Three Day. Within two years, it was raising eighteen million dollars a year. The California AIDS ride was raising, you know, eleven, twelve million dollars a year. Uh, we raised more money more quickly for AIDS and breast cancer than any causes in history. Well, how do you get an event to raise $18 million the second year or the third year of its existence? Well, you don't do it by hanging up uh, eight and a half by 11 flyers in the dry cleaner, right? <laughs> like you, right. you're not going to attract enough people to reach a scale of $18 million. What you got to do is you got to get into the, the, the advertising game in a big way, the way the big consumer brands do, which means, you know, back in that time, it meant you need to take out full page ads in full color, full page in the Chicago Tribune. And you need to run radio advertising drive time in the morning and in the in the evening drive home. And you need to pay top dollar for that stuff. You know, you you, you need to spend a million dollars on advertising. And you say, okay, well, that sort of makes sense. You spend a million dollars on advertising, you can attract, you know, thousands of people that raise thousands of dollars each, and you got an eighteen million dollars event. All right, well, where are you going to come up with that million dollars, right, to run the advertising? Well, if if you're blind to the notion of capital, and you're a small nonprofit, and you look at your petty cash, and it's seven thousand dollars, well, you say, I can't. There's no way I can do it. But if you say, well, why don't I go out and borrow a million dollars? Or why don't I go out and offer someone a return, a 10% return on the money we raise if they'll give me a million dollars? Now you can do a million dollars worth of advertising. And that's exactly the way, you know, entrepreneurs in the for-profit sector think. Elon Musk, when he wanted to start Tesla, didn't say, well, what if I get my bank account? Well, uh, you know, no, <laughs> yeah. he went to the capital markets and raised billions of dollars to build the factories and do the things that he really needed to do it right. The nonprofit sector keeps doing it small because it looks at what it has in its bank account rather than saying, here's what I need to do it big. 
let me go out and raise that capital somehow. Not donations, but capital, like debt. You know, and that's what we did. We we raised debt, um, and 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 eventually, our because we were raising so much money, one hundred and eighty million dollars a year. Our bank said we'll start loaning you money to launch new event concepts. That's just simple use of capital 101. But we're expected to cure juvenile diabetes. We're expected to curb poverty in major populations. We're expected to eradicate homelessness in big cities. Huge things. That's part of the problem. You see, we're not expected to cure juvenile diabetes. We're not expected to end hunger. What we're expected to do is keep our overhead and salaries low. Yeah. And as long as we keep our overhead and salaries low, then we'll get a gold star. Whether we cure juvenile diabetes or not, that's completely beside the point, the way we look at the sector now. Now, it should be that our job is to end juvenile diabetes. It should be that our the expectation is that we um, eradicate hunger. Um, but to do those kinds of things, you'd need to abandon all of these anachronistic dysfunctional ideas about salaries and overhead and advertising and marketing. And, and, and for the donor that, you know, that might be listening and, and saying, saying, well, I, I don't, I don't want my money going to those things like advertising and overhead. I don't want my money going to that. I want my money going to the cause. Well, let's define the cause. Do you want your money going to end the problem? Yeah. Okay, well, if you want your money to go to end the problem, then those are the things you need to invest in. Now, if you want your money to go directly to a kid, is that what you want? Yeah. Well, if your money goes directly to that kid, there's going to be hungry kids forever because we're never going to be able to get big enough to, to meet all the kids. So you've got to start to think about what you really want and what you really want. And I know what you really want. You really want the problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> well, solving the problem is going to take a completely different way of thinking than, look, if, if you wanted every dollar to go directly to the kids, you don't need a nonprofit sector. Just walk out on the street and start handing kids dollar bills, you know? <laughs> or, or other donors at that point, right? Do you want to be the only donor? Or, or, do, yeah, or can we use this money to generate right. more donors? Right. Which 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 kind of leads us to the to the the leadership thought piece of this. Right. Because you have articulated and, and I got to tell you, every other nonprofit exec listening to this like I did. We felt this kind of stuff under our skin. We felt like the deck was stacked against us. Right. We felt like our hands were tied. Right. And we're expected to do big things by the community. Man, it just seemed frustrating. And then when I first heard you articulate this. Uh, in your TED Talk and then reading your book and then, of course, in person a couple of times, um, it just resonates. So, I mean, it, it, I mean, I kick myself afterwards going, oh, my God, it's obvious. Right. Right. It's, it's, it's so but it's not so obvious. So you you have in your career, you have been combating a precedent, a limiting precedent that's literally centuries old in this country. So when you started stepping forward, uh, you're boldly coming out with these things that challenge Everything that challenged the president, challenged the way we thought about charity. What kind of uh, resistance did you have to overcome to get your message out there? Well, it's still there. You know, it's it's the resistance of centuries of another way of thinking. You know, when I wrote my first book on this subject was on charitable and um, I wrote it in 2009. It was published by Tufts University Press at the time. And I, I had... Uh, I had an opening quote by George Bernard Shaw, which was, all great truths begin with blasphemy. Um, and then the opening of the first chapter was a quote by John Kenneth Galbraith that was, all successful revolution is the kicking in of a rotten door. Um, and it just, it takes time. You know, like people will say to me, well, you, you just, you're never going to change the way people think about charity. That's the way they think. It's the way they're always going to think. And you're never going to change it. Um, I, I simply don't believe that. You know, history is nothing but a record of leaders changing the way people think about things, whether that was the right of women to vote, whether that was gay marriage, whether that was seatbelts, smoking, civil rights, you know, slavery, you name it. I mean, history is just a record of a new generation of human beings looking at the world and saying, uh, this is screwed up <laughs> and, and changing it, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and that can absolutely happen with charity. And, and the thing that fortifies me and, and, um, that, 
emboldens me, I guess, to continue to do the work is, you know, I can walk into a room. I, I've, you know, spoken all over the world. Sometimes it's a class of 18 students and sometimes it's a conference of 5,000 people. And, you know, after 45 minutes of common sense, you got a line of people coming up to you saying, oh, my God, I never thought about this this way. I can't <laughs> yeah. believe it. I feel so guilty. You've completely changed my mind. If you couldn't change people's minds, you know, I would have opened a chain of yogurt stores or something. <laughs> um, but you can change people's minds. And it's a it's a joy to see it like they just don't have time to think about this. Their people lead busy lives. They get their kids in school and, you know, their health and their jobs. They aren't out there thinking about the economics of the nonprofit sector in their spare time, you know. But if you if you come and you give them a new way of thinking, most people will embrace it. And Robert Kennedy said famously, 70, excuse me, he said 25 percent of the people are against everything all the time. Well, guess what? The other 75%, that's more than, that's all you need to change the world. So I don't worry about the 25% of people who are just stubborn and obstinate and there's no way you're ever going to change their mind. It's that other 75% who are open, who are positive, who are not cynical, um, who want to see the world become a better place, who are legitimately curious about how to do that and who are legitimately opening open to learning what we've been doing that's wrong. Those are the people um, that I that I love. And they represent the majority of the world. So you're really not concerned with the foot draggers. You're focusing on the change makers. The, the foot dra draggers are a waste of time. You'll go to a, an early <laughs> grave trying to change their minds. And all they want to do is hear themselves talk anyway. You know, they get these big, fat opinions based on zero expertise in history. But they love to hear themselves talk. And, they, you know... And that'll happen, too, at a speech. You know, I'll have a I'll have a line of like 19 people who are all excited and they feel liberated and they want to do new things. And then there'll be this one guy who just wants to, like, take up all of my time and tell me all of the reasons why I'm wrong about this, you know. Um, and, and you just got to say, you know what, buddy, you used up your time. Let me talk to some people who really want to change the world. <laughs> Moving right along, right? Well, you know, it, I experienced that after we did our sessions. You know, it was going back and now, now sustaining that, right, as people started to, like you pointed out, get busy, think about other things, and let some of those preconceptions or misconceptions kind of creep back in. And um, so I, I, I took your book. I took Uncharitable. It was required reading if you were going to sit on our strategic planning committee. You, you had to read it. And um, so, you know, trying to, and we reiterated it all the time in communications to the board, trying to keep it in front of them and keep it, keep them that way. And I, I think once we had you back and you talked to our, our board at United Way, um, I think it made a permanent change. And uh, the board, that, that, that organization is doing incredibly innovation, innovative stuff now. And so, so you know, l launching out on that now, I mean, so here we are. You, you mentioned 2009 Uncharitable came out. Um, 2013 was your seminal TED Talk that's watched. I think I last read it was watched a thousand times a day around the world, which is freaking yeah. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's an incredible TED talk. It's one of the top TED talks of all time in terms of what's watched and shared. And, um, and there's a reason for that. So we have a link for it at a boldleader.com in addition to links to your books and stuff. We've been at this for a while now. So we're coming up on 10 years since that talk. And so how are we doing? Well, a lot's changed, you know, um, about three months after I gave that TED talk, three of the big evaluating agencies saw the writing on the wall you know, the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance and, and uh, Charity Navigator and, and GuideStar uh, and Charity Navigator had been, you know, the one promoting the overhead measure, you know, and you can count on us, you know, we'll help you make the wisest giving decision. We'll show you which charities have the lowest overhead. And then after my TED Talk, they wrote a press release saying, we write to correct a misconception <laughs> about what matters I most remember that. donating yeah. to a charity. Don't ask about their overhead. Many charities need more, to spend more money on overhead. So that was like hell freezing over for them to <laughs> sign on to a statement like that. And then, you know, more recently, five of the big foundations... Uh, uh, MacArthur, Ford, uh, Hewlett, um, Open Society came out with a joint press release saying that they were going to dramatically increase the overhead allowances for their grantees in order to destigmatize overhead. 
Uh, Darren Walker, the head of the Ford Foundation, said that this overhead thing is a charade and we've been a party to it and we've known it. He went on 60 Minutes and said the same thing. You know, you now have social enterprise programs and nonprofit management courses, some of which I teach at Harvard and other places, you know, teaching the next generation of leadership to think differently about this. But, you know, I am under no illusions. We've got a long, long way to go. If you drew an analogy, say, to to gay marriage where, you know, I'm I'm gay and I'm married and I have three kids and, you know, uh, it's 2022. Um I would say on the chair, changing people's minds about charity, we're at the equivalent of about 1946 uh, in no. the gay marriage. You know, we got a long, long, long way to go, but it's begun. Um, and this year, we're um, releasing a, a powerful uh, documentary film uh, based on my book, Uncharitable, that I think is going to be um, this issue's equivalent of an inconvenient truth. Um, and, and really begin to change the minds of the masses. Because the book was for people inside the sector. The TED Talk really reached people in the sector and donors. And now it's time to reach the everyday person, the person on the street who still thinks the best way for me to judge a charity is by their overhead and salaries. So uh, Darren Walker's in the movie, uh-huh. and uh, Edward Norton, the actor's in the movie. Nice. Billy Shore, who created... No Kid Hungry, uh, Chris Anderson, who runs TED, um, Stephen Gyllenhaal, Jake and Maggie's father, yeah. directed the movie. And um, we're just looking at the final cut tomorrow. Then we're doing the music and the animation. So it'll be out probably this summer, this fall. That's big, man. Well, you got yeah. a big week. Congratulations. That's, that's, is it going to carry the name? Is it going to be Uncharitable? Yeah, it's going to be called the movie's called Uncharitable. Yep. And that's going to be powerful. I, I got to tell you, listening to everything you've talked about that's happened in the space since the TED Talk and since Uncharitable, congratulations, because we may be back in 1943 still, but we're not in the Stone Ages. And you move some mountains there, man, when you got Charity Navigator come up. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Hey, we've been a party to the. Yeah, I mean, that's how that stuff changes. And um, that's, that's really impressive. I, I remember when we went through, at the time it was Boulder Board Training, now it's the Bold Training. Uh, which is available at danpilata.com. We have links to that too. But I remember you you talked about the need to think like Kennedy thought when he challenged America to get to the moon and the Apollo project was born. Is that still a part of the training? It's huge. You know, it's really huge. And, and you know, what I tell people is you got to be willing to be ridiculous. Um because we're so buttoned up, right? And we want to yeah. fit in with the crowd and we don't want to rock the boat and we want to be thought of as, you know, sane. Uh, and you need some insanity to change the world. You know what Steve Jobs said? The people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And people say, well, what do you mean you got to be ridiculous? And what I mean is, if, and I mean this with all my heart, if you're not being laughed at, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> you, I've been you doing that right my whole life. Not thinking big enough. If you're not being criticized by experts, if they're not saying you're out of your mind, if they're not saying you're irresponsible um, with your big thinking, you're unethical with your big thinking, you're raising people's hopes unnecessarily. If people aren't saying that to you, you're just part of the system, man. You're not. You're not thinking big enough. And you know, e- Elon Musk has been laughed at with the whole world looking on, you know, oh, you're going to colonize Mars. What, what is what is wrong with this with this guy? You know, just, as I said in the bull training, you remember, you know, Thomas Edison comes up with the light bulb, right? Yeah. What do you need to get that to work? Well, I need <laughs> wooden poles planted all over the world. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, we're going to do that. Go get a new job, Tom, because that's <laughs> never going to happen. But but people. I can't emphasize it enough because we all want to look good and the need to look good is killing people because when you need to look good, that means you need to do everything the same way everybody else is doing it and the same way it's always been done. And you can't create change by looking good. You just can't do it. So you've got to let go of that, you know, and, and, and I don't care if you're sacrificing money, you work for a nonprofit and you want me to put a halo over your head because you're taking a salary that's $40,000 less. I don't care how much money you're making. What I care is, are you willing to sacrifice your reputation in the name of putting something new into the world, the likes of which humanity has never seen before? 
You know, I remember the frustration when I would come up with something we needed to look at doing, and the first the first words out of uh, the board's mouth were feasibility study. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> to your point about, you know, Edison and, and putting up wooden poles and, and running lines and stuff, it's, uh, it, it's, it's stuff like the Apollo Challenge where we don't know how we're going to get there, but we need to get there. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have a clue. You know, we could have failed with the whole world looking on. And that would have been, you know, a colossal failure. Nixon had a speech prepared prepared for how to talk about three astronauts, you know, or two astronauts stranded on the moon and one potentially stranded in space. Um, You know, that would have that would have been a colossal failure, risking the whole American experiment. Um, And we took that risk and, and it's not, not only did we take a risk, you know, cause the word risk gets thrown around all the time. Now, mostly what people mean by risk is um, I'll take a risk as long as I know it's going to work out. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> yeah. not the nature of risk. The nature of risk is you don't know if it's going to work out. But the other thing that's so important about what Kennedy did is he set a deadline. Um, and we don't have deadlines for the end of hunger or Alzheimer's or cancer or any of these things. And if you don't have deadlines, you don't have urgency. And if you don't have urgency, you aren't really pushing your full potential, the potential of your intelligence, the potential of your humanity. You've got to be up against the gun. You know, it, will your kids go to school if you don't tell them it starts at eight o'clock? Like if there if there ain't a deadline. Like yeah. for you get out the door and get on the school bus. Is there a chance in hell that they're going to get on the school bus in time? Not a chance. I mean, it's as, it's as simple as it's not rocket science. <laughs> NASA was not rocket science. You know, <laughs> yes, it, was. it was common sense. Like you need a deadline. That's the first time. That's I got to write that down. No, Apollo <laughs> was not rocket science. <laughs> Um, yeah, it'll get a lot of responses like mine. So, well, you, you help organizations with these kinds of things sometimes. Are you involved in anything now, a really big endeavor like that? Yeah, check out collaboratory.org, C O L L A. Yeah. It, Down in Fort Myers. Yeah. We, um, that was I just the called them the other day. That was the Southwest, that was the Southwest Florida Community Foundation. And they did the bowl training three years in a row. And Sarah Owen, who runs the place, said, I want to do something really big. And we said, great, let's change you from a grant making foundation to a massive coordinating entity that's like NASA to coordinate the solving of all the social problems in that region on an 18 year deadline. And uh, bravely, she said yes to it. They changed their whole identity to collaboratory. And if you look on it right now, it says, you know, we're going to we're going to coordinate the solving of all our region's social problems in 18 years. It's a big, big, daring statement that they've made. I got to tell you, man, I did not coordinate this with you. It's going down. But I was just on with Sarah discussing collaboratory and I I sat in I sat in on one of the explanation sessions at the Uh end of last week. Yeah, I mean, because well, I'm representing Board Build, which is a it's a, a way to, to to train and match board members with their passion. It's a phenomenal, cool thing, and we're looking for a partner down there to do it. And I was looking for somebody innovative enough to break into it, and I found Collaboratory. And man, I should have known when I listened to that explanation. I saw your your fingerprints all over that. <laughs> yeah. Well, good job. Yeah, when we're actively actively working on that, um, and. Uh, and that's based on another element of NASA, you know, of Apollo. So there's Apollo and there's NASA, and they're two different things, right? Apollo was the mission to the moon. NASA was the entity that coordinated all of that. And, um, you know, there were 400,000 people involved in the Apollo program at, at its peak, um, 30,000 of whom were employees at NASA. They didn't build anything. They didn't build the Saturn V or the lunar module or the lunar rover. They didn't design or manufacture the gloves. They didn't design the guidance computer. NASA just coordinated the thousands of subcontractors that were building all of that stuff. And that's how we got to the moon. But if you look at community problem solving, go into Fort Myers, go into Boston, go into Dallas, You'll find all the subcontractors, right? All these nonprofits working on trying to solve problems, but no NASA, nobody coordinating it and no deadline. So there's not a chance in hell that you're going to solve the social problems in any of those communities because you need a one to 10 ratio of organizers to doers. And what you have in the nonprofit sector is a ratio of zero, zero coordinators (laughs) for every one doer. 
It is sad, man. Well, let's let's launch out from there and start talking about resources then, because I, you, what you've done right now to everybody listening that's got a foot in this space is they're jazzed, right? They're excited. They're like, man, I I got to find out more about this. I'm on fire. So, um, what are some places to go? I know I know that um, the Everyday Philanthropist, you know, is your newest book, right? Yeah, the Everyday Philanthropist. Basically, I I took on charitable and I I made it accessible to anyone and everyone. So the Everyday Philanthropist is literally a one hour read. It's got 32 little micro chapters. They read in about two minutes each, really big type, big graphics and cartoons, you know, so you can, you, you're, you can give it to your dentist, your carpenter, your plumber, your hairdresser. It's designed for anyone to be able to understand this stuff. Whereas Uncharitable was a more academic, you know, much, much, much deeper dive. Well, as a retired Navy flyer, I wish I'd gotten hold of the everyday philanthropist. It sounds like it's more my speed, but um, I, had to, I, <laughs> but I, I did get through uncharitable. So, uh, no, that's so it's, that's awesome. So it's kind of it's kind of the cliff notes or the summary version of uncharitable, uh, easy to digest, about an hour read, and there's a link to it on uh, at a bowl leader dot com. Um, are you still doing virtual, Dan? I know for the pandemic, you started. Uh, doing virtual appearances. Is that still going on? Yeah, I do a lot of them. Um, and I got spoiled, you know, when the pandemic started, I stopped flying all over the place, giving speeches in person and discovered that I really, really like not being on airplanes. So, um, so I do everything virtually. Now the bowl training is all online. I, I'm not really leading that live anymore. Um, but it's online in a five, uh, seven module, three and a half hour course. And, you know, you can you can have everybody on your board watch it, and then some new board member joins three months from now. You can have them do it too. So it works out well. Um, the the you know Zoom has really it's changed the way we work, and uh, it's a much more efficient way of reaching people and changing minds without getting on planes. Well, and that on-demand training too is nice, right? Too, like you said, if you bring yeah. somebody onto the board, they can go through it too. And that's a that board build that I was talking about earlier. That's how we designed it too. It's it's on-demand training, so you don't have to make a session or travel to anywhere to do it. Same yeah, kind of like, thing, you know. Yeah, it's the old way, you know. You had, you, you did the the bold training in Texas there, and all right, if you got a new more board member three weeks later, all all you had was, oh, you should have been at this training. It was so good. <laughs> well, talk to me about the kits, right? So you've got some staff and board philanthropy kits on the site. What's that about? Yeah, the kits have um, the everyday philanthropist in them. They have the flat org chart, which is a monograph I wrote that um, talks about the role NASA played in getting to the moon and the, the kinds of local NASAs that we need to solve community problems. And then there's an enrollment to the bold training in there as well. So it's three really great tools to really in, in, in less than a day, uh, blow your mind and liberate your intellect and um, ignite your imagination about how you could really change your community in an unleashed way, not beholden to these old ideas that have kept you from really changing it. Well, Dan Pilata, I can tell you as a as a Navy flyer moving into nonprofits, I was kind of a troublemaker as it was. But you <laughs> listening to what you put out in uh, in in that training, in the Boulder Board training, the Bowl training, and reading Uncharitable, that ignited my fire to make changes and to make lasting changes. And I'm hoping some folks that listen to this will uh, will absorb that. Will visit the links we've got on aboldleader.com and uh, hit those hit those resources and, and pull them in as we, uh, as we get ready to, to, to wind this thing down, you got any last minute advice for somebody who's, who wants to make a big change out there, but they're facing a lot of kind of traditional thought uh, in terms of hanging in there and being that bold leader. First thing I'd say is um, you're bolder than I am. Cause I, I got my private pilot's license and I was willing to do that. And I learned how to fly but you got your pilot's license being willing to be shot at at the same time. So you're a much bolder guy than I am. But, I, you know, to, to anybody who's listening, I would say, look, you got one human life and you do not deserve, you didn't do anything wrong. You don't deserve to be in a prison of ancient thought that, you know, the Puritans came up with 400 years ago. You deserve to explore your full potential and look to the don't don't look or listen to the people that are criticizing you don't look at the cynics don't look at the skeptics look at the people that you admire 
you know, keep their pictures and their movies and their books around you, you know, whether that's Steve Jobs or whether that's, I don't know, Oprah Winfrey or Elon Musk or Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King, whoever, keep that influence around you and find other living people in your community who have that same passion to um, fly by the seat of their pants to experiment with something bold and daring. Um, you know, you, you deserve to have support around you because left alone in the sea of cynics, it's going to be really hard. So that would be my biggest piece of advice. You deserve to fulfill your true potential and put other people around you who are willing to say the same thing. Dan Pilata, a bull leader. Dan, thanks a lot, man. It's been really great catching up with you. And thanks for being on the show today. All right, TD. My, my pleasure. Uh, good luck uh, to you and, and everyone listening. Thanks for listening in to this episode of No Clichés, the podcast from a bold leader. For visual stuff from this episode, like text, pics, and links, visit aboldleader.com slash blog. And don't forget to follow or subscribe and then ring that bell for a heads up when the next episode posts. I'd also like to know what you think, so if you have feedback or just want to say hi, you can leave a voice message at anchor.fm slash aboldleader or a written one on the homepage at aboldleader.com. I'm T.D. Smyers, and I look forward to having you back. Mm-hmm.